This is where I get to be a voice in your life that reminds you that you are the righteousness of God in Jesus Christ. The voice in your life that helps you realize that you are more than the math of what is against you. That you are more than the mistakes that you have made. That the great I am lives in you. And whatever he is, you are too. Woo! I feel a flow coming. I feel a flow coming too, but it's not a flow of anything good. Can't see it right now. Can't prove it on a chart. Can't draw it on a graph. But I got God. I got God. We followed you. We trusted you. And now you're leaving us. No, I am not leaving you. I am changing forms. If you know Jesus, I am sorry to break it to you. This church is not for you. What he said, I had to correct him on later. But to me, he made a really big mistake when he was praying the prayer. I believe, without a doubt, that's the part he should have left out. I believe, without a doubt, that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the Savior of the world, I told him never do you stand in the pulpit at elevation. Do I want you to put people in a position where you're telling them to pray something that they can't honestly pray? As a matter of fact, because there is not one of you in the room, even with tabs in your pink Bible, can honestly say, without a doubt, not a one of you. I got a degree in the Bible. I'm gonna blow your mind. A porn addict can pray while he's looking at porn. When God said, I am to Moses, my name is I am. He was trying to get him to see you are as I am. It's in me. It's in me. It's in me. I am God Almighty. How arrogant. There are many unbiblical, outright demonic, and radical teachings being taught at churches like Elevation Church of Stephen Furtick and Lakewood Church of Joel Osteen. Those demonic teachings don't seem too blatant to the undiscerning ear. However, those teachings influence everything else that those churches do. Let us take a look at the recent backlash from Elevation Church, which I strongly think stem from all those unbiblical and demonic teachings. Hello everyone and welcome back to a new video of the Gospel of Christ. I invite you to subscribe and click the notification bell to know when we upload new videos. All right, guys, take a look at this headline. Stephen Furtick facing backlash because Elevation Church won't use words like resurrection on Easter invites. Now, if you think that's bad, take a look at this headline. Elevation Church's digital content director explains why they would never use words like resurrection or Calvary or blood of Jesus when sending out Easter invites. It makes someone feel like an outsider. Let's roll the tape. For us, the most important thing on Easter is inviting people to church. And so this particular biblical event of Easter is tied directly to our mission. Um, and so, so that's so important to us. And so when I think about how I'm going to talk about Easter, I'm thinking about talking to people far from God. So just to like give you just like a teeny bit of a glimpse, I'm talking all the way from people who have been in our church for years, and I want them to invite people to church. Um, but I'm putting a lot of my focus, energy, time, resources toward what I would call the cold audience as people far from God. And so I'm not going to say the word Calvary. I'm not going to say the word resurrection. I'm not going to say the blood of Jesus, uh, right? Um, I'm not going to say any of these words that make someone feel like an outsider. This is really important. Um, a, a, an important guiding principle for how we develop language is um, anyone can be a part of our church. In other words, you water down the resurrection in order to make it more appealing and more palatable to sinners. And that's how you gain an audience. And that's how Elevation Church gains the audience. Might I add, that's how they retain the audience. Don't let anybody put anything on you that will cause you to forget what God put in you. The fight that you have to win for your life has not been with them. It's always been in you. Because if you believe it's in you, there's nothing anybody can put on you that can cancel what I put in you. Before you were born, I appointed you a prophet to the nations. It's always been in you. And there's nobody that can leave my life that can keep God from keeping his covenant with me. I'm not in covenant with a person. I'm not in covenant with a political party. I'm in covenant with God Almighty. I am God Almighty. 
I am God Almighty. Now, that clip, understandably, made a lot of waves in the evangelical world a few years ago, and people kind of excused it, uh, saying, oh, well, that was just uh, an inarticulate moment. You know, he kind of got tongue-tied, he, you know, lost track of his words, and he, and he didn't actually mean that he is God Almighty. And when I first saw that clip, I was inclined to think the same thing. I thought, okay, I'm, I'm no apologist for Steve Furtick. Um, he is he is a wolf. He's a false teacher. He is indeed unqualified, as John MacArthur pointed out to him. Uh, but I thought, okay, I really don't think he actually meant that he is God Almighty. Until I saw another sermon from him from two years before in 2019 when he basically said the same thing. Watch this. God said, let us make man in our image. In our likeness. You are not my maker. You will not be my mirror. When God said, I am to Moses, you know, my name is I am, he was trying to get him to see you are as I am. Well, that certainly wasn't Stephen Furtick getting tongue-tied. That wasn't a slip of the tongue. No, that was very deliberate. Furtick said that when God gave to Moses his own name, I am, he was trying to get Moses to understand that everything that he is, God is, Moses is too. Uh, no, actually, the exact opposite of that is true. Dear friends, God is without peer. He is without equal. That is blatant heresy from Stephen Furtick. And even at that, uh, some people still tried to come to Stephen Furtick's defense and even attack me, criticize me for pointing this out. I did a YouTube video on this uh, a couple of years ago. But um, if you if you're gonna if you're gonna try to defend Stephen Furtick even at that, well, good luck defending him after. This this was recorded, or at least it was posted on uh, their their website YouTube channel, just a few days ago, as of this recording in mid February, 2024. Watch. I'm glad you're here. If you're watching online, I'm glad you chose to watch this video. God knows there's a lot of other stuff you could have watched on the internet. Here you are listening to a Holy Ghost preacher today. Now I want to interrupt just for a moment. So Stephen Furtick says uh, there are other things you could have watched. Yeah, there are. And uh, you would you would do well to watch uh, someone besides Stephen Furtick because he is a heretic. And he said, you're listening to a Holy Ghost preacher today. How arrogant. Uh, he, Stephen Furtick just drips arrogance. Arrogance oozes out of his pores. Uh, this, this is not a man who takes the pulpit with any sense of awe, any sense of reverence, any sense of humility before God, he is absolutely full of himself. Uh, he is not full of the Holy Spirit. He is full of himself. But uh, I digress. Today I'm releasing to my church my first new book in eight years, Do the New You. And you get it first. That's right. This is written so I can come home with you. Sound kind of weird. This is where I get to coach you. This is where I get to be a voice in your life that reminds you that you are the righteousness of God in Jesus Christ. The voice in your life that helps you realize that you are more than the math of what is against you. That you are more than the mistakes that you have made that the great I Am lives in you, and whatever he is, you are too. Woo! I feel a flow coming. I feel a flow coming too, but it's not a flow of anything good. Dear friends, that is objective heresy. Stephen Furtick says that the great I Am resides in you, and whatever he is, you are too. Blasphemy. Heresy. Uh, dear friends, when when we you may have heard uh, people refer to the attributes of God, uh, the the qualities, characteristics of God. Those that's kind of weak. 
terminology, uh, the attributes of God or the perfections of God. So when you hear of God's attributes or his perfections, it is those qualities, those characteristics that God possesses in absolute perfection, hence the perfections of God. And we typically divide the attributes of God into two different categories, communicable attributes and incommunicable attributes. The communicable attributes are those attributes which we as humans, as God's creations, uh, we share in those attributes with God. Now God has these attributes in perfection. We just kind of dip our toes in the waters a little bit. So some of the communicable attributes of God would include his faithfulness, his patience, his mercy, um, his justice. Uh, these, are, these are attributes that we also possess, love. Uh, we, we as his creatures, we can and should have patience. We can and should uh, show and exercise mercy. We can and should love people. Uh, particularly as Christians, our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ, of course. So these are attributes that we share in. They are communicable attributes. Again, he has them in complete and total perfection. We just dip our toes in the water just a teeny tiny little bit. He has them in perfection. But then there are the incommunicable attributes. And the incommunicable attributes are those attributes which God possesses alone. And we, as his finite creatures, do not at all participate in. We do not have them even a teeny tiny little bit. They reside and belong to him and him alone. The incommunicable attributes would uh, include those attributes like immutability. That simply means that God does not change. Well, does Stephen Furtick change? Of course he does. You and I change all the time. We are constantly changing. God never changes. Hebrews 13, 8, amongst other texts. God does not change. We do. Uh, the eternality of God. Uh, and of course, all of us will live in one of two places for all of eternity. But we did not exist in eternity past like God did. The, and then there's the omni attributes of God, the omnipresence of God. God is everywhere at all times. There's nowhere where God is not, including hell, by the way. Read Revelation 14, uh, 9, 10, 11. God is, is in hell, if you will, uh, in his mode, in, his, in, his, in, his, in the expression of his wrath. God's wrath is being poured out, even in hell. So God is in hell, even in hell, pouring out his wrath. There, there is nowhere where God is not. There is nowhere we can go to get away from God. Um, God is omnipresent. We are not. God is omniscient. He knows all things. There is nothing that can be known that God does not know. No. Uh, we're not omniscient. Stephen Furtick, you are not omniscient. You are not omnipresent. We are not omnipotent. God has all power. There is nothing that he cannot do that is congruent with his own will. Now, there are some things that God cannot do that he cannot lie, he cannot sin, he cannot change. Not just that he won't do these things, but he can't do these things because they go against his, against his character and his nature. But everything that is within God's will, he has complete power to do. Everything that is that is congruous with his character and his nature, God has complete power to do. He is omnipotent. Stephen Furtick, you're not omnipotent. No one is except God. So the omni attributes. Uh, then we could talk about the aseity of God, A-S-E-I-T-Y. And the aseity of God simply is that characteristic or attribute uh, which denotes that God depends upon no one and no thing. He is self-existent. Uh, God, there are no causes upon which God relies. Nothing brought God into existence. 
He is self-existent. He has always existed from eternity past through eternity future. There has never been a time when God was not. We don't have a seity, dear ones. It is just manifestly false and objectively heretical to say that everything that God is, we are too. Stephen Furtick has said this now on at least three different occasions, and there's probably others of which I'm not aware, but at least three different occasions. So, you know, one, two, three strikes, you're out. This is not a slip of the tongue. This is not a moment of being inarticulate. He flat out said that everything that God is, we are too. Blasphemy. Isaiah 40, verse 25, this is God speaking. To whom then would you liken me, that I would be his equal, says the Holy One. Dear friends, this is not a challenge. God is not saying, I want you to try to think of someone or something that you can compare me to. This is not a challenge. God is saying he is without equal. He is without peer. There's no one, no thing that you can compare God to. Stephen Furtick is a heretic. He is manifestly unqualified from being anywhere near a pulpit. I wouldn't even allow Stephen Furtick as a member of my church with that kind of heretical theology. Stephen Furtick is a false teacher. And Stephen, if by some chance you watch this video, um, I'll say the same thing to you that I've said to other false teachers. I do not hate you, but I do hate what you're doing. I don't hate you. And I care enough about you to tell you the truth. You are heaping untold condemnation upon yourself. You need to come to Christ in true repentance and true faith. You are not a believer. There is no way that you could be indwelt by the Holy Spirit of God and have the kind of arrogance that you have, teach the heresies that you have taught, endorse the obvious false teachers that you have endorsed, many of them. You are not a believer. Stephen, you are a sinner. We all are, but you are a sinner. You have broken God's laws. You have broken his commandments thousands and thousands of times in word and deed. And just like when we break laws on earth, there's a penalty to be paid. How much more so when we break the laws of God? But because we have sinned against God who is eternal, the punishment of that sin is also eternal. And Stephen, if you die in your sin, you will very rightly and very justly go to a very real place that the Bible calls hell. The worm will not die. The fire will not be quenched. The full, undiluted fury of God's wrath will be poured out on you for all of eternity. And there is nothing that you can do to save yourself. No amount of good works will earn God's favor. And please do not think that just because you have a large church and you've got millions of followers and people who fawn over you, please do not think that that is a sign of God's blessing or approval. Not at all. Not at all. The opposite of that is true. Stephen, I don't want you to go to hell. I want to be able to call you my brother in Christ. But there's no way you can be indwelt by the Holy Spirit of God and teach the things you teach and endorse the people you endorse, partner with the people that you partner with. There's just no way. If you were truly indwelt by, if you were truly a Holy Ghost preacher, as you say, um, the Holy Spirit of God would bring heavy conviction upon you. And yet you are just so full of yourself. Stephen, God has made a way for you to escape his wrath. He sent his son, Jesus Christ, to this earth, and Jesus lived a perfect life, truly God, truly man, one person, two natures. And as the God-man, Jesus lived a perfect life to the perfect satisfaction of God, and then willingly laid down his life on the cross. His life was not take it, he, taken, he gave it willingly. And on the cross, this perfect person offered his perfect life as a perfect sacrifice to perfectly satisfy the perfect wrath of God, died on the cross 
three days later, bodily raised from the dead, proving himself to be who he said he was, God in human flesh. And Stephen, if you will repent of your sin, turn from your sin, and place your trust in Christ, he will save you. If you will come to Christ seeking not only a Savior from hell, but a Savior from your sin, he will save you. If you come to him grieving over your sin because you understand the that your sin grieves God, and you understand the weight of the reproach that you have brought upon Christ, and the weight of the 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 of how many people you have led astray in the name of Christ. If that bears heavy on you, and I hope and pray that it does, come to Christ empty-handed. He will save you. And if God saves you, if he grants to you true faith and true repentance, then one of the fruits of that repentance, the good fruit that that repentance will bear, is you will realize that you are not qualified to be in the ministry. You're not qualified to be behind the pulpit, and you'll step down. You'll no longer be a pastor. You'll shut it all down, Stephen, and you'll find a good, doctrinally sound church led by biblically qualified men. And you'll not be behind the pulpit. You'll be in front of the pulpit, in the pew, learning. And it is only then that you will truly grow in Christ. And I want that for you, Stephen. I truly do. And I pray that God grants that to you.